Okay, great. So I think we'll get started. Uh, so good afternoon, everyone, and thank you all so much for joining today. Uh, my name is Anna Shortley. I'm a research and policy analyst with the Greenbelt Foundation. Um, I'm here on behalf of Kathy McPherson, VP Research and Policy at the Foundation and VP Strategy and Programs at the Greenbelt Fund, who unfortunately couldn't be here today given all these overlapping commitments. Uh, but she would also like to extend a warm welcome to you all. Um, so today we have a great panel of five farmers from across the Greater Golden Horseshoe region who are going to share their experiences living and working in peri-urban areas. So as we know, this, this region is growing quite rapidly um, and urbanizing quite rapidly as well. And we know that these new land uses that are coming in, as well as the new population and access to these urban markets, continues to shape uh, unique challenges and opportunities that farmers near grow growing cities, suburbs, and towns face. So challenges including, you know, more traffic on the roads or uh, complaints about smells, um, but then also opportunities to do some more on-farm diversification, uh, pick your own operations, things like that. Um, so how this webinar will work is we'll have our moderator, Dr. Sarah Epp, who I will introduce just in a moment. Uh, she will facilitate a discussion with our five uh, panelists. Um, and then there are, it will also be an opportunity at the end uh, for you all to ask questions. Um, so you can ask questions at any time during the webinar. You just type it in into the Q&A box um, and we'll get to them at the end of the session. So I'd now I'd like to welcome uh, the moderator of the session, uh, Dr. Sarah Epp. Uh, Sarah Epp is an assistant professor of rural planning and development at the University of Guelph. Uh, she received her BA and MA in geography from Brock University and completed her PhD in rural studies at the University of Guelph. Sarah has worked extensively with rural communities in Southern and Northern Ontario, examining issues related to farmland loss, agricultural viability, and uh, land use conflicts, and social aspects of rural life. Sarah has previously worked in municipal land use planning and as a private consultant for a variety of rural and agricultural planning projects. Uh, her current research interests include rural land use planning, agricultural systems, food security, and cannabis. So I'm going to stop sharing my screen now and I welcome uh, Sarah to uh, take it away. Thanks so much for that, Anna, and thanks for the introduction. I'm really excited about today's webinar as it's definitely a topic I've spent a lot of time researching. And with everything I do in academia, I think the best way to understand the impacts of policy development or growth on the agricultural sector is really to speak with those who are directly impacted by it. So we do have a fantastic group of panelists with us today representing very diverse geographic areas and farm types. And what I'll do is I'll invite each panelist to provide an introduction on themselves before we get into the moderated discussion. As Anna did note that you're all welcome to pose questions to the group. We'll try to get through as many as possible using that Q&A box and you can do it throughout the session. We have about 15 minutes or so held for that that sort of open discussion so please do take advantage of that time before we get into any of the questions i have for the moderated session i will ask each panelist to introduce themselves and if they feel uh, they're able to to turn their camera on so first we'll go to paul burnham hello everyone can you hear me yes okay good Yes, my name is Paul Burnham. Uh, along with my family, uh, we run Burnham Family Farm Market uh, between Coburg and Port Hope and Burnham Farms Limited, which is a cash crop operation. Um, my wife and I, my wife Anne and I have four children, all of which have returned to the farm in different uh, capacities. My son operates the cash crop operation. My youngest daughter has sort of taken over the farm market my oldest daughter had runs an equine facility on site and um, my middle daughter um, is learning how to do the horticultural end of things to supply the market so we grow fruits and vegetables uh, asparagus uh, strawberries raspberries sweet corn apples pumpkins beans and peas so we grow we don't grow everything we sell out of the market we have quite an extensive bakery um, in the market and uh, we bring in some uh, fruits and vegetables from Toronto uh, and we try and maintain uh, only Ontario or Canadian grown product. Um, the equine facility run by my daughter Jennifer has about 30, 35 horses um, boarding and then she owns about 14 that she gives lessons on. Um, we farm 
for cash crops, we farm about 1,900 acres. Uh, we grow corn, soybeans, white beans, azuki beans, wheat, and hay. So uh, we can see subdivisions from Coburg um, from our windows. We can also see open fields from our windows. And we are on the main artery between Coburg and Port Hope, and it's uh, quite a busy, quite a busy uh, road. So I think that's probably all I need for introduction. Great, thanks for that, Paul. Uh, thanks. Next, we'll go on to Mike Kozlerik. <clears throat> thanks, Sarah. Uh, good afternoon. My name is Mike Kozlerik, and I uh, represent Kozlerik Family Farms, located in the town of Niagara on the Lake, um, which is about 10 kilometers from Niagara Falls. So the town uh, receives about 3 million visitors every year. And, um, you know, we're 10 kilometers from Niagara Falls. They get about 30 million visitors. So um, we've seen an explosion of tourism uh, come to the area over the last 20 years. Uh, I am the second generation farm uh, operator. Uh, my parents purchased it 40 years ago, and uh, we've always been a wholesale directed uh, company. Uh, we grow tender fruits and wine grapes and tender fruits uh, as apricots, peaches, pears, plums, and pears, um, and wine grapes as well. And so we've always been wholesale driven, but over the last 10 or so years, we've uh, had subdivisions pop up across the street um, and a, whole, whole, a lot of people uh, coming to retire in Niagara Lake, over half of the population, about 20,000 people is retired. And so um, we've seen a big increase in in uh, residential um, going up around us. And that's kind of driven us to be more farm gate oriented as well, along with wholesale. And so, uh, yeah, welcome to uh, receive any questions later today and excited to be here. Thanks, Mike. And now we'll move on to Megan Richardson. Hi, everyone. Um, thank you as well for the opportunity to be here. It's nice to speak with you today. Um, so I'm Megan Richardson and I run Mabel May Farms in Burlington, Ontario with my husband and his father. Uh, we've been farming in this area for about 150 years. I'm first generation, but uh, Norm, my husband, he's fourth um, on his dad's side and many, many generations back on his uh, grandmother. So we're very fortunate. We have a beautiful farm right on Appleby Line between Burlington and Milton which affords us a lot of opportunity if we wanted to do uh, people facing um, markets. And uh, so that's something we've been starting to look at. But traditionally we are a, a hay and forage operation. We run about 1200 acres um, in the area farming between Waterdown and Guelph. Uh, we grow switchgrass, miscanthus and hay, um, mostly for the bedding and livestock market. We also run a grass-fed lamb operation on the farm. Um, we're host to um, a meadery and honey company called Back by Bees. So they're also on our farm property. And we stuff erosion control socks out of one of our buildings. So we're really um, diverse, I guess. And that's one of the things that we've enjoyed about being near the urban areas. There's so many opportunities. Uh, and then I have an off-farm job working in the food security sector. Uh, which gives me a very interesting lens um, as the Director of Grants and Special Projects for Food for Life. So happy to be here and looking forward to answering your questions. Thanks, Megan. Uh, next, we'll go on to Buji Anakufi. Hi, can you see me? Hi everyone, I'm Buchi Onakufe of um, I'm Buchi Onakufe of Akachi Farm. Um, I operate a 12.4 acre farm right in the heart of Woodbridge. Um, the farm is located on Pine Valley, um, Pine Valley Drive between Major Mark and um, Rodapod Road. It's right in the it's right in the Courtright Center for conservation. Um, I'm first generation farmer. Um, originally my education background is microbiology, uh, medical. And um, when I got to Canada, I got interested in the food security, food availability, clean food. And I decided to go into farming. Um, we have um, 
7.4 acres um, cultivatable land, which we grow um, a large variety of vegetables. We also have the animals um, like sheep, goats, turkeys, rabbits, chickens, duck, and some guinea hens. We, there's a large bee operation very close to the south field, which helps in um, pollination. And we try to practice um, permaculture. Uh, I would like to call it biodynamic uh, farming because everything in the farm is being recycled and every aspect of the farm supports and enables another section of the farm. I farm by myself with my little daughter who is grown now. She's now a teenager. I get student farmers um, in the summer for two to three months, depending on how well they do. And we go to the Brampton Farmers Market. We tried the Woodbridge Farmers Market this year. But um, because we're in the city, um, we get a lot of um, visitors. The Cotright has over a million visitors, those that come in by the gate and pay, and maybe another million that come in the back door. So it's um, very busy there. And um, we do a lot of um, farm gate sales. I'm happy to be here and um, I'm happy to be here speaking with you guys and I hope they understand um, what we go through, what we're trying to get to and we can get um, our, we can get our consent out there to people who can really help. Thank you. Thanks, Bucci. And last introduction from Paul Watson. Um, Hi, I'm Paul Watson. I uh, run Watson Farms in Bowmanville. We're right on Highway 2. We have a farm market, which is right across the road from Walmart. Uh, we do pick, my dad started Pick Your Own Strawberries in 1970. And then he added a couple of years later, Pick Your Own Raspberries. And about 75, he added Pick Your Own Apples. And then when I graduate, uh, when I finished my first year at Guelph, in 91, I decided I was going to open a farm market. Um, so we grow, we now grow asparagus, strawberries. Um, I've grown raspberries up until last year. We're going through a bitter divorce and trying to get things straightened out. But I'm hoping to, I've, I have raspberries for pick your own still. And I'm hoping to grow a bunch more crops for our retail again. Um, we always grew peas, beans. We had 50 acres of sweet corn and I have 80 acres of apples. Uh, we did pumpkins and squash. Um, but this was all pick your own and farm market. And we had three retail operations, satellite locations in Oshawa that we ran for the summer. Um, our main farm backs right onto a subdivision. There's three feet between the house, the closest house and our fence line. And our other main farm uh, backs onto the 418, and which is the link from 401 to 407. And then we have another farm just south of that as well that's all orchard. Uh, we, as I say, my dad started farming on the farm in '70 in '69 when he graduated Guelph, and I took over the operation. Um, gradually over quite a number of years and so we've been battling lots of problems with neighbors ever for the last 20 years I'm not sure what else i can tell you <laughs> thanks paul we'll have lots more time for more input as i get into some of the questions and so I do have three sort of structured questions that I'll pose to the panelists and um, you don't, I won't speak to anybody in particular. You're welcome to jump in, raise your hand if you wanna talk first, however it feels most natural. And we'll, we'll just go through the questions and then we'll get into the less moderated session for the question and answers from the audience. So my first question is, can you describe the main challenges you have experienced farming in a peri-urban area? We've heard a couple of those already. And with that, have you witnessed these challenges evolve or change over time? 
So any challenges that you've experienced that anyone would like to, to speak with? Yeah, Mike, I see your hand up first and then we'll do uh, Kotobuchi after. Yeah, super, Sarah. Um, I'd say probably in Definitely the uh, intensification of uh, housing uh, back in the 70s and 80s and 90s. It was quite a state lots that were built around here. Now it's it's kind of being brought in. So I guess trying to make use of whatever lands left for development um, is is uh, very very crucial in in here. But that's yeah. Thanks for that, Mike. Uh, Bucci, I think you are next. Um, over the years, I discovered there's been like more people moving and um, people seem to look at the farm as um, a place of entertainment where they could um, trespass without, they look, they watch where you are and they trespass regardless of, um, you know, the safety of the animals the safety of your produce and, um, you know, the economic impact on your produce because, you know, they walk across the fields, step on things, and some pick things along as they go, you know, like you leave some um, seedlings in the field, you know, it, it's getting dark, the rain is coming, there's thunder, you, you have to leave there. You're not going to take all the trays back, you, you leave them there and you cover them the next day you come continue. They come and pick what they need for their garden, you know, and go and like the apples, they just come and watch you. When you are in the field, they go the back way and they start harvesting apples and they don't have to pay. And some come, you know, there's been a lot of trespassing and they don't, they don't um, obey the rules, the signs. And this is among the matured adults people between 40 and above, they do this. The kids will look at the, the teenagers, I find that the most respectful. They look at the sign and they signal you, and sometimes you talk to them and you tell them, not today, come the next day, the animals will be out, you can play, you can stay by the fence. But um, the matured ones are the bigger problem. They say, oh, we're just feeding the animals. You are not supposed to feed the animals. It's a private business. I have to work, you know, and it goes on and on. And with the COVID, it's worse because I have um, kids, you know, lots of um, preschoolers that come out there with their parents, take a walk. And I let them, you know, the animals go to the fence and they see the animals. But with the COVID, you're not supposed to touch or feed the animal. But the parents will say, it's okay, just rub the head. It's okay, just pat it at the back. <laughs> and I keep telling them, it's okay, pat it at the back. If the animal gets infected, this is 100% organic. I put it down. That's the truth. If it gets infected, I'm not introducing antibiotic to reduce the immunity of my flock. I put it down. And that's, that's my biggest challenge. And the theft is my biggest challenge. Vandalism, theft disturbance is my biggest challenge. And I can appreciate the frustration with the, the farm sort of being viewed as a playground for those that maybe aren't familiar. I see, yeah. I think Paul Burnham, you put your hand up to, to add to this discussion. Yeah. Um, we're just, uh, I would have to say that the, the subdivisions have only come close to us in the last few years. So um, we're starting to experience um, the public just considering it a right to be, to walk anywhere they want to. Um, and we're trying to control that. Pick Your Own this year was a fantastic uh, boon to our business because people needed something to do and Pick Your Own uh, went up higher than it's ever gone before. Um, and I guess the overall issue of urban sprawl, like I've been battling urban sprawl since I graduated high school learning about um, how valuable farmland is is not valued as farmland it's valued as development area and it's just under underappreciated the um the value that class a land the class one land uh is just being ignored and uh, development just takes place at the next available farm that's being sold um 
so part of our challenge as a business is educating people to that and trying to get them to understand that the farmland is a limited resource and we should treat it with respect and um, treat the people who try and farm with respect because as you say there's trespassing issues there's some theft starting to show up um so yeah this has kind of evolved over the years and it like it's it's just it's just starting to creep into our business now as far as the trespassing goes Yes, Megan. Paul, I, I couldn't agree more about the, the trespassing. We're, we're lucky that we're not right next to development yet, but it's amazing how many people, I, I don't know if they understand this isn't conservation area or it's not a park. Um, so definitely I think there's a tremendous amount of education that needs to happen in these peri-urban areas. Um, same goes for transportation. I often don't think people really know what they're looking at when they see our hay wagons on the road. Um, and they don't know how to react around large equipment. Uh, I would say the same would probably be true for combines and that sort of thing. Um, cyclists, they don't really know how to interact with this equipment. So we find that they'll slow down going uphill and cause us to not be able to pass them. Um, you get into this little bit of a cycling tractor um, competition and that's not safe and it's not uh, very helpful or healthy um, for either parties. I think for me, we're coming into a season of meetings and my impression is that those who don't live in peri-urban areas um, have a little bit of easier time with the regulations. So for our farm, we're in the NEC, we're in conservation, we're green belt, um, we're prime ag luckily, but we also have natural heritage land. And so I find that most me most weeks we're two to three means a, an evening on policies that will impact our farm operation in the future. And that takes a lot of time away from actually just running your business and farming. And we've had uh, several uh, farm our age, we're in our early thirties, um, have decided that they would rather move to areas where perming is easier or they don't have to worry about these um, various regulatory bodies and the clash that we sometimes see. So I think that's one of the challenges that we don't talk enough about it affects our operations, but we're not um, vocal is the, um, the mental strain of that and the emotional strain of always dealing with these things overall. Uh, the other thing I find is a little bit challenging for us because we're livestock producers is um, Burlington, as you've heard, probably is a little bit of a hotbed of activists. And so that's just a concern in the back of your mind and it affects what you will put out on social media. It affects those sorts of things. Um, we're very easy to find. You can see the farm right from the road. So uh, those, those sort of things can become challenges in these urban areas. Um, I think lastly, the other one I find challenging in our area, um, and we don't hire a, a lot of people, but cost of living right near our urban areas is quite high. And so when we're employing people, we have to be considerate of that. Um, the rates are somewhat different across Ontario. And I think definitely in the GTA, if you're looking at a living wage of $20 an hour, that's um, a considerable pay rate if you're trying to employ several people on the farm and your family. So I think those were my big, my big ones. Thanks, Megan. Uh, Paul Watson, did you want to add anything? I see, I know Paul Burnham put up his hand, but I'll go to Paul W. first. I think I put up my hand. I'm not exact, I don't know whether I did it right or not. Um, yeah, we have, my dad sits on he was on two ag advisory committees, one for the municipality and one for the region. He still sits on one for the municipality to try and make sure that the municipality is aware of some of the challenges that farmers, especially in and around town, but throughout the, throughout the area, the challenges we face. Um, I know being so close to the subdivision, being right on the other side of the fence, uh, we have issues with birds, both in the, we get seagulls in the strawberries. And of course, sweet corn is very problematic for birds. Um, we've had uh, 
by law enforcement in several times threatening me. Um, I almost got arrested one day because of the bird scare out in the orchard. The, the police came in and unfortunately they're not aware of all the rules that, you know, they complain about the noise and they thought they had every right to shut me down and they didn't. And they weren't aware of the Farming and Food Production Protection Act. Um, so yeah, noise is a huge issue. Dust is an issue. Smell is an issue. Um, you know, I've been criticized numerous times for spreading manure. We don't have animals, none. So we don't spread manure. It's two farms over. But if they smell it, it's automatically assumed that it's me because I'm the one on the other side of the fence. And being in retail, that doesn't always look good. You know, they're not going to come shop at my market now because I'm stinking up their backyard Sunday afternoon when they've got company over and they're trying to cook steaks on the barbecue. I'm the one with egg on my face. And that's, uh, that's very challenging when you're, when a big part of your operation is retail. Mm -hmm. um, tractors on the road, it, we get scared on a regular basis, almost daily. Cars trying to pass you as you're going up a hill. And, you know, I'm sitting up high enough. I can see the guy coming the other direction, the dump truck. The car's passing me, can't see it. And they don't care. They turn around and cut you off because they realize somebody's coming and almost put you in the ditch. And it's a, as I say, it's a daily occurrence. Um, there's four kilometers from the, from the farthest, four kilometers between the farthest farms, you know, so we're not driving that far. And, you know, if you made four trips back and forth in a day, you'd probably be you, guaranteed you get a scare once maybe even twice. Um, it doesn't matter what track that you're driving, it's just because you're driving slow. Mm -hmm. So it, it, it has proved, you know, I mean, it's very beneficial because we're retail, the customers are nice and close. So there are good parts to it, but there's major challenges as well. Absolutely. I, I might, um, I'll go to Paul Burnham and then while Paul's talking, I might encourage everyone. We've heard a few challenges and a few solutions. Education was mentioned as one piece. And I might ask each of you to think about some other solutions to some of those challenges you've, you've come up with today or that you're experiencing as uh, I let Paul Burnham uh, respond. Yeah, just one more thing I thought of, well, more than one thing, but I'll, I'll mention this one. Something that we share with our urban neighbors towns and that probably most of the farmers in our township don't share uh, and it's a major problem uh, popping up all across Ontario is the homeless problem. Um, we have people last winter for the first time we had people come out and uh, sleep in one of our hay sheds. <laughs> it surprised me because I went out to clean out part of the shed and um, I went to move some things and I looked over and I saw a blanket and I said what's that blanket doing there and it turned out there was somebody sleeping underneath it and it sh really shocked me and I thought okay this is uh this is a new issue <laughs> so what do we do about that uh, I ended up uh during the day I ended up uh bolting that uh, building shut so they couldn't get in uh, but it, it poses a safety hazard not only for those people but you know should a fire start or something um you know they could be injured, plus the whole business could go up. So that is a very new problem that uh, we just happened to experience this past winter. Yeah, a very different or more extreme version of trespassing, for sure. Yes, yes. And one that I don't know that I have a solution for overcoming. No. <laughs> well, it, it's, it, it's a province-wide problem, like a country-wide problem. And uh, like, what do you do? Like, I feel sorry for them, and I'd like to provide something for them but at the same time I can't have 30 people you know staying in a barn kind of thing. Mm -hmm, there's, only, there's only two or three individuals but it could easily easily escalate should word get out. Mm -hmm. So I see Bucci has her hand up so we'll, we'll go to you next. 
Oh, you're just on mute though. You'll have to unmute yourself. Uh, there's one very, very um, serious problem. It's coming up gradually, but very steady. That the new the new thing on um, vegan and animal rights stuff. Uh, you have like you have people. I know there's been the pandemic, but before the pandemic, they had people who had other issues. From my view, and are taking it out on um, um, farmers on the livestock. You know, they feel you know animals and humans have the same rights. I don't know how that happens, but you know, they just feel that you have no right to farm or kill an animal, that the animal should be there, you take care of them and they come look at it. And, you know, I don't know what they want the farmer to feed on. And they are becoming more vocal with the, with the um, technology now, they're able to share things and stuff like that. And sometimes they go out of their way to confront you and your client. I've had someone who came to me and had a customer there that came to pick up turkey and said to her, oh, the blood of these animals are on your head. What makes you think you have the right to kill another animal? You know, it's not like a gaming thing. It's not like you were there, we were slaughtering it right in front of you or anything. This is cleaned out, packed turkey, and it's somebody's meal. You have no right crossing into my property to challenge somebody on what they eat and what they shouldn't eat. And these people are getting away with it. And I think um, it's high time they do something about this because it's not right for business. And it's not right for the general health of the population. No matter how we look at it, all these foods have their specific nutrient value and how the body can absorb it. We need meat, we need the byproducts, we need eggs and milk and all that. If you're not gonna eat it, that's fine. But don't get up every morning and come and sit there. Some come and they play guitar for the bed, you know? There's a whole lot of issues that are going on that I think, you know, that the local government or who, whoever is in charge should look into to help sustain the, the farmers. Because they are using all the flat land, the good land, are all going in for you know development. Then what are we going to eat at the end of the day? We can't eat apartments and houses or property tax. People have to eat to stay healthy mm -hmm. and to live. That's a big issue, and I don't think there's anything that stops them. You know, I haven't heard of a law or anything that stops them that you can't come there and abuse somebody. I don't care if it's verbally, but it's not right for my client, you know, because they wouldn't come next time, you know, with that kind of a thing. Absolutely. And it's it's a very complicated aspect. And I, I've heard some of the comments of some benefits in being very close to urban areas in terms of customers and, and perhaps part of this being very much a drawback. You're too close almost to, to um, urban environments and it makes it too easy to gain access. And I'm curious mm -hmm. if maybe I'll shift our conversation a little bit from the challenges. And I grew up on a farm family as well. So I, I definitely understand the challenges that we're speaking about today. And I'm curious if anyone wants to speak to some of those advantages of farming near a peri-urban area. And I know we've heard a couple, but if anybody would really like to highlight some of those benefits. Bobby, I see a hand up. For me? Okay. Um, we live... Uh, about one mile exactly from a major mall in town. Um, and three hardware stores and restaurants, uh, pizza joints. So <laughs> in one way, we're living on a farm out in, out in the nice countryside. But on the other hand, we're very close to all the amenities of town. So um, that's one advantage uh, of, of being close to town is that our supplies are very close and we don't waste a lot of time traveling on the roads, you know, going to get parts or going to get some hardware. So, um, yes, and of course our, our customers are really close. Um, so it's easy for them to get out. It's helped both the equine center and our farm market business for sure. 
Anyone else? Megan. Megan and then Paul Watson. Yeah, so for, for us, um, the, if we think there's tremendous opportunity if you're the operation who wants to do this to actually engage the public. So on farm education, agritourism, all of those things are really the world's our oyster if we want to do those types of um, markets, I believe. Uh, I think that the community, at least our community, seems to really want them and respond well to them. So that's been very positive. Um, we need to do that. So we need um, to be allowed to put proper roadways into farms, that sort of thing, to mitigate traffic implications on roads. So there do need to be some policy allowances for on-farm diversified, um, ag diversified opportunities. Um, I think for, for us with the hay business, I mean, our customers are right in our backyard because hay people kind of, hay people, um, the horse industry kind of does a perimeter around um, cities and towns, right? So that is a very good thing for us. Uh, we're very lucky. And I'd say another opportunity that we've kind of picked up on and we've been very fortunate to have, as much as I don't love seeing them, is people who want to buy a 40, 50 acre property and build their dream home don't know what else to do with that 40 acres of farmland. And so we've actually really done a concerted effort to um, establish relationships, to steward those properties. And that's allowed us to build our acreage more so than we ever could have trying to purchase land in this area. So that's been a, a big benefit and opportunity for us to, uh, to steward other people's farms as well. A very interesting side effect for sure of that sort of urban encroachment. Paul Watson. It's certainly been very beneficial for us to be as close as we are to town from a retail standpoint. Having said that, we're not even though, I mean, we're literally across the road from Walmart. We're not close enough. And I started back in 99 running satellite locations in Oshawa. Um, we got as high as three locations. We sold 60 to 70% of our 50 acres of sweet corn in Oshawa at our satellites, which is nothing more than a tent in a Canadian tire park. We had two Canadian tire parking lots uh, on ones that were on busy roads. And that was a substantial part of our operation. And I'm not the only one doing it. Um, you know, I know lots of guys in the berry industry are doing this. Whittemore Farms was the first one I heard about doing it and I followed their lead. And it became a very important part of our operation. Um, and, and when you start doing that, all of a sudden the location of, your, of where the stuff is growing is irrelevant. We don't need to be farming where we are. Pick your own, the customers will drive to it. Um, and from that standpoint, if my shop and the hub of my operation wasn't where it is, I would move it in a heartbeat to get away from the problems of trying to farm that close to a subdivision. I'd maintain my retail operation there but the rest of it would go mm -hmm. where find some place where in, you know, where land is cheap. I haven't got neighbors to worry about and take the produce to the customers. Um, I, I don't know, but I, I'm not going to change my operation now, but if I were starting over again, that's exactly what I would do. Which is a fair point for sure. Um, I saw that Mike's hand went up and she's as well. So Mike and then Bucci, and then I'll probably move on to the last moderated question at that point before I go to the question and answer period. Yeah, thanks, Sarah. Um, I would say uh, definitely the, uh, you know, the, from the wholesale marketplace that we uh, uh, have always served for many years, um, urban encroachment has allowed us to focus more on the farm gate sales and higher margins by having, the, having kind of bike tours come in. They've been drinking wine all day and they come in and spend a lot of money at the farm market now so they're quite happy to eat local and something they can take home um so we're we're kind of blessed you know we, we don't have a gravel road anymore it's asphalt and 
and uh, one car a day used to come by. Now we get a thousand cars because they've opened up uh, a different section. So it's uh, it's kind of improved our our space and allowed us to kind of diversify as well more into the processing with the two by four jam company that uh, we're involved with as well. So we're we've kind of diversified our range just from not from raw product but also to uh, uh, value added goods to improve our our margin line. So that's just my my five cents. Thanks. And Bucci. Thank you. Um, from my location, um, being in the city has been like, it's been like a blessing. One, your mental health is very high. You're very happy. You have a lot of people coming. You have nice people to come in. And the sales have gone up. And um, you get a lot of programs like school, school, kids coming in, different research. Like um, last two years, I had a student from, postgraduate student from U of T, and they, they have some, they, they have a project for Nicaragua and all that. And the materials they use and the, the prototype is left behind for irrigation, which helps me, you know, and I don't have to pay for that. Then York region, um, during the volunteer week, they have like um, 200, one, about 200 students come to the Cotright Center and, you know, they don't have much to do. They ship me about 120 and I have them for the day. The onions is planted, garlic is planted, cleaning up is done. Then you have, um, you have different, um, you have the play group that come weekend with their parents, just little kids. And you see how happy they are and the way they scream, that laughter, the happiness, you know, it cheers me up even if I've been having a bad day on the field or something, you know, and um, the sales, most of those things transfer to sales. And because I'm right close to them and they can see that it's clean food, you get to keep those clients for a long time, except when they move and that's when you lose them. But sometimes they still may take, you know, do the drive and come to you. You also get a lot of retired um, farmers, that the old generation farmers that come around to visit and, you know, take in the fresh air, look at the animals. And you get a lot of advice from them how to do this, how to fix this, and, you know, how to make your job easier, more profitable how to manage different problems on the farm. And some will come up and check up on you, you know. So it's um, socially, it's, it's a big yes, you know, big boost. Financially, it's also good because if the markets are bad sometimes, especially like for the last three years, markets have not been very good. I don't worry that much because the next day I sell at the farm and some days, you know, before the market days, you get good sales. And a lot of people donate like, when they are moving, they donate like barrel, freezer, wood panel, things they use for constructions that um, they don't know what to do with. They are not gonna use it anymore, leftovers. They donate it to you and it helps. So that's, um, I'd say that's a big plus. That cuts down your um, that cuts down your financial input mm -hmm. by more than 40%, which is big. Yeah, the, the, the importance of relationships being very, very critical for yeah. either negative aspects or potentially some very, very positive ones. I'm just seeing the time and I think we, I'm going to skip my, my last moderated question because I think we've heard some of the, the changes and, and ways you may, have, you may have restructured things with that urban encroachment. And I'm going to move over to the Q&A section and we do have some questions that have been posed uh, from the audience there. So what I'll do is I'll read out the question and again, I'll, I'll welcome anyone who wants to participate in that question to respond. And so our first one is, what changes would you like to see with regard to planning policy in Ontario and how would these changes impact your operations? Any, Paul, go for it. Yeah. Um, I've always been on this bandwagon of uh, preserving agricultural land and 
I know there's policies in place like the green belts in place to protect land, but it's only as good as the next government. It's only as good as the next developer that comes along and spends years and thousands of dollars to push his case for you know putting a new subdivision in. Um, and some farmers would be against what I would like to do, which would be to, to, to freeze all agricultural land as agriculture. And it's kind of pie in the sky, but it's what I believe in. It's what my family believes in. Um, so maybe a little more teeth in the land preservation, a little more think outside the box from the planners, like think of where land development should go rather than where it's the easiest to, to do it. Um, I know they like developing around services like sewers and water, but can that not be done maybe in the less desirable agricultural um, uh, situation? So I know that sounds pie in the sky, but I do believe eventually we will come to that because we're going to run out of agricultural land sooner or later, not in your lifetime, not in my lifetime, but down the road, it's not going to be easy. Thanks for that. Others who would like to jump in with that question about policies, planning policies you'd like to change. Bucci, mm -hmm. go for it. Um, I would like to see Am I mute? No, nope, you're good. Okay. I would like to see policies that are made to just, as Paul said, to protect the agricultural land. And they should have agricultural land close to urban areas with policies that will allow the farmer operate, um, operate in, a, in a comfortable and safe environment. Which will, which will also benefit the people around and not disturb so that both people can, you know, operate, you know, simultaneously in, in a respectful and productive way. In that policy should be made. Um, no matter what your beliefs are, a farm is a farm. You keep your belief outside the farm and the farmer here has rights. You know, the farmer has right. Because you come in there with your dog on leash, then the farmer cannot do nothing. But your dog can attack the animals, attack the farmer, and the farmer has no 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 protection. Mm -hmm. So it's an animal, it just got out of hand. They should be like policies that should see for penalties for those kind of things. You don't bring your animal into somebody's business. It's like bringing um, a gun into the bank, something like that, <laughs> you know? Mm -hmm. Everybody's gonna be scared. You don't bring a bulldog into a chicken farm where they are free range. You don't bring a husky into a sheep farm where there are lambs running around. Respect the signs. The signs are there for a reason that I really want to see that. Thank you. Um, I We'll do Megan, Paul, and then we'll go on to the next question. So I, I think that one of the challenges we have in the near urban area is that some of our municipalities try to be more restrictive than the provincial policy statement. And I really don't see any advantage to that for farm viability in these areas. We need all the tools that we can use um, to remain viable and productive. Um, I think policies need to be clear, concise. And one thing that we add for in Halton is a one window approach. So instead of having to go to every single different uh, policymaker and plead our cases, looking at it as almost a round table. So you do your pitch once and then you move forward. Uh, oftentimes I think innovative things are not getting off the ground because they just get buried in paperwork. And it's really unfortunate and it doesn't do our industry any any benefit. Absolutely. And Paul Watson. One problem we have is we're surrounded by housing. We have houses on the my the home farm, there's houses on the uh, east fence line, and just the other side of the farm on the 418 is houses. And the municipality kind of have this has this idealistic approach that they want to actually turn that into green belt. Right now we're white belt. And 
they they want a separation between Bowmanville and Curtis. And they've run into the same problem between Whitney and Ajax. They want to maintain a strip of farms. And that sounds like a wonderful idea, but it, it's only wonderful if you're the farmer trying to farm that land. Um, we're kind of getting pinned in. Uh, we've been, the municipality is asked to change it to Greenbelt. So that means we can't afford to sell and move elsewhere. So we're, our hands are getting very tied because, you know, they want to make everything look good, but they don't care about how it affects the farmers financially, uh, how we run our operation, you know, day to day things. It's not easy. And you know, there, there is part of me that would be just as happy to, to move and start elsewhere so that I'm not surrounded by houses and dealing with the problems that we have to deal with. But they have to make the policies for right along subdivisions. They have to make it workable for both. When, when the subdivision was first put in on our back fence line, we never objected to it. We didn't say bugger all. And our first thought was, well, the municipality has a 50 foot setback from the property line. So at least we know there's no one we know how we're going to have 50 feet. Well, that policy only applies on our side of the fence. Mm -hmm. On their side of the fence, the setback is one meter. Um, I've seen this with hog barns. I know a fella his dairy barn burnt down. It took him two years to rebuild the dairy barn because it was too close to a subdivision. Well, the subdivision moved in. They didn't have to abide by the setbacks from the dairy barn. The dairy barn has to abide by the setbacks from the houses because they're urban, we're rural. And you can't draw a line in the sand and say one policy is on that side of the line and another policy is on the other and make, and make the farmers abide by the policies but not the town and subdivision abide by those policies it's it's a challenge given new subdivisions perhaps part of that then is through site plan control and other um zoning bylaws greater setbacks for new developments from a fence line and, and maybe creating buffers and, and things like that on the development side because you're absolutely right the farm the farm can't move there's a fence there the farm's not going anywhere but maybe there is some opportunity from a planning perspective to be a bit more considerate or reflective of the challenges that farmers will be facing with that new development. Um, I'm going to go to another question that gets back a little bit to some of the suggestions we had, especially around the education piece. And so the question is, who should play the role of educating the public about normal farm practices, trespassing, navigating farm equipment, municipal governments, developers, real estate, home sellers, or you, the farmer? What is the best way to educate in your opinion? There's no right or wrong answer. I have Paul B and then Paul W. Yeah, um, I think I don't mind doing some education, but when I start educating, I, I am appalled at the amount of things that people don't know. Like we have people come into our market and they pick up a potato and say, why is there dirt on this potato? And we say, well, it's grown in the soil. Oh, and they go, oh, I don't want that. And they throw it away. Like, what did they think? Potatoes grow on trees or something? But, um, and I think it stems back to our education system too. Like I'll, I'll do my share, but I think I'm pretty sure there's, uh, the schools have um, agricultural in, in, the, in, their, in their books, but there's, I don't think the teachers know how to teach it. And that's not their fault because they haven't been taught how to teach agriculture, but I think kids in school need, need to learn about where their food comes from because there is a, such a big disconnect between people and their food. And it goes to people, I mean, we get people 60 years old that I'm amazed at how little they know. And, you know, if they don't know anything, what does, it, what does a seven-year-old know? It, it's, it, we can't do it all ourselves. I think the school system has, needs to have a mandate to teach people about teach kids about food um because it's it's the basis basis of life absolutely paul watson and then we'll go to bucci 
I would agree with Paul. Um, it needs to start when the kids are very young, but the responsibility, the responsibility needs to be on everyone. It needs to be on the farmers. It needs to be in the education system. It needs to be the municipal, the regional, the provincial and federal government, because this is an issue Canada wide. Um, they need to learn to learn about how their food is grown and to respect farmers. And it's not that I want to be somebody special that everybody has to be re respect, but I want to be able to do my job without all the, without all the problems we deal with, um, of our, problems with our neighbors, problems with people driving down the road, problems with people picking apples just pulling over on the side of the road and going and helping themselves to a bag of apples. The responsibility can't fall solely on the farmer. Absolutely. It needs to, it needs to be everybody. It needs to, the guy building the subdivision needs to think about this. You know, he needs to educate people when he sells the house that backs onto the farm that, well, there may be things happen there that you don't agree with, you know, he could be pasturing cattle there if he wants. He can spread manure. He can, he'll be spraying. There's going to be dust. There's going to be noise. And they need to make sure that the people buying these houses are well aware of that. Yeah, that um, edu educating everyone, essentially. And everyone has responsibilities, what it sounds like. I, that's, that's my feeling. Bucci, and then uh, I think I'll move into sort of the wrap-up question. I see Megan, so Bucci, Megan, and then we'll go into the wrap-up question. Oh, you'll just have to unmute yourself. Yeah. Can you hear me now? I can hear you, but we can't see you, but that's okay, you can keep talking. Oh, shit. Uh, you can hear me now? We can, yep. Okay. I think that this um, educating everybody is um, mainly on the educational system and the municipalities. It goes high to the federal, but that would be like a broader thing. You need to, you need to talk to people so that where they can see, they can understand. You need to communicate. And the only way you can do that is when it's like, um, when it's very close network, smaller groups, the developers, the municipalities and the education system for each different area should be structured in a way that um, when they have like their volunteer days or they should have days, they have Terry Fox run day, they have different things run for this cancer and there's so much awareness. They should have those days that they, this is farming day, where your food comes from, but you know, where um, our health comes from and all that. And they should take these kids to these close by farms. They are, we're close to them. Take them there. They speak to the farmers. Uh, the municipality should pitch in, get people to help out. And those days they should have like, each municipality should have like a farm awareness day or maybe thank you to the farmers <laughs> if I'm going that far. And, you know, the kids from little grade should go visit the farm, see what happens in the farm, how things are done, and that way they will understand it better. Thank you for that. Uh, so Megan, I'll let you speak. And then Mike, I'll put you on the spot with my last question at the end here to help wrap things up. So Megan. So uh, I think that one of the things we're missing is that driving schools and as part of getting any sort of driver's license in, the, in Ontario, you should have had to sit in a tractor trailer and see what you can see. And in a tractor, I don't know how many pieces of machinery we have to get people into, but people need to intimately understand that people cannot see you in your car when you're trying to pass them, that sort of thing. So I think there's a lot we can do um, in Ontario with driving schools, signage on roads. If you go to New Liskard, you see this big bull, this huge billiard, and it says um, now entering farming country. And it shows a slow moving vehicle tractor. So why we don't have that on every single um, rural road heading out of town, I'm, I'm not sure. I know it's expensive, but 
we need to remind people that we're here. Absolutely. And it could save lives in the end as well. So Mike, to, to put you on the spot with the, my sort of last question is, is there one key takeaway you would like the participants on this webinar to know about what it's like farming in a peri-urban area? Yeah, I think uh, probably the key takeaway is, uh, you know, for me, the name of the green belt is more environmental belt. So it just doesn't, uh, you know, the environmental belt has opened it up to allow everybody to look, critique farmers and look at the way farming practices are doing instead of promoting them and helping them more so. But I guess that's uh, probably, um, you know, with the depends on the government and stuff moving forward that that, that could change. But it's, uh, it's really, um, yeah, I guess that would be my, my takeaway is everybody, everybody has a, a lens now on, on the agricultural community where before it maybe wasn't so uh, look, it wasn't looked at so in, in depth, but now it's uh, really a focus for everybody anywhere, really. 20 years ago, I didn't sense that. So, um, but that's probably the, the idea and how to, how to help farmers through this lens and, and, um, and make, make them stay, stay in business, really. That's the challenge, right? So, and not give in to selling, uh, selling out if they can. Perfect. Thanks for that, Mike. The word I think that kept coming up into my head while everyone was talking today was complicated. It's very, very complicated and complex. And there's lots of very unique challenges that each of you are dealing with, and hopefully lots of potential to, to move on from some of those. And I believe we're going to pass it over to Anna to do a wrap up. And I'll, I'll quickly thank everyone for myself. This has been very informative, and I've definitely enjoyed this session. Great. Thank you so much, Sarah. I know we're over time, so it'll just be a minute. I just want to thank you all for joining uh, us this afternoon and a special thank you to Sarah for moderating this session and to the five uh, farmers here, Megan, Mike, uh, Bucci, Paul, um, Paul, and you, Mike. Who did I say? I miss Megan. I, I, I thank you all, <laughs> is what I'm saying. Um, I'll just let you all know that we did record the session. So um, I'll send a follow-up email to all uh, attendees uh, with the link when it's ready. And if you have any comments or feedback you want to share, feel free to email me. Uh, my email would be on the original webinar invite. It's a shortly at greenbelt.ca. Uh, so thank you very much and have a great rest of your day, everyone.